Welcome to everybody to the Quad in Derby here tonight to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Lara Croft, the most amazing Tomb Raider that's ever walked the planet. I first met Lara some 20 years ago when, as chairman of IDOS, I was tasked with a quest to do due diligence on a gold company called Center Gold, which owned Cool Design and through a blizzard I drove in my car to get to Derby to meet at the doorstep Jeremy Heathsmith, MD of Core Design. And he showed me around the studio and in the last room that she was on the screen, the most amazing creature I have ever seen. It was Lara Croft, and I guess you could say it was love at first sight. But seriously, folks, Lara Croft has been an incredible creation by all the guys at Core Design, Toby, Paul, and the team is just an incredible achievement. Gavin, Nathan with the music, it was incredible. And you did something that nobody else had done before, 3D character, 3D world, multiple levels, great technology, great gameplay, and the most amazing character that's ever been created. And she survived the test of time. Here we are 20 years later celebrating the wonderful creature who is Lara Croft. Strong, intelligent, athletic, independent, a true puzzle solver, combatter, and explorer of incredible worlds. So I say, raise your glass and long live Lara. For the first part of our q and I would like to invite Ivan Archer, Ian Simons, and Gavin Rubbery. Firstly, we've got to start with Gavin. You got an honourable mention by Ian Livingston. <laughs> um, you were there at the start of court. Um, you headed it, headed it uh, to towards the end. Um, did at that initial start, did you ever think that this game would have the impact it's had? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. <Matt. laughs> Elaborate, please. <laughs> Um, when we, well, when we first make it, obviously, you know, everyone hopes their game's going to be a success. So, obviously, we were, you know, like every team that's ever made a game ever, you were hoping it's going to be a success. Mm -hmm. um, but when I first arrived, the first time I worked on it, I didn't think we were even going to make it because Toby described this game that sounded so ridiculous compared with what we, you know, we saw in the game shops at the time. It was so advanced because he was so he was an animator and he was so into the idea of building this, you know, thing that was like a movie. Um, and so he described this incredible game to me on the first day, and I just thought, oh my god, well, well, this just can't be happening. This must be an amazing team I'm going to be working with. I went into this room and there was just four people in it, all down there, and you know, Toby and Paul and Jason Gosling, I think, was there. Anyway, and it was just like. Talking to them and they'd no, I haven't really worked on a three D game and no, I've not done this. So I was really not confident that we were gonna to manage to do it. Um, but as time went by and we started putting this together, things started to happen on screen. Um, you know, you could tell it was coming together, you could tell it was, you know, a good game. Um, but it wasn't really until it properly came out and we started seeing the sales figures, we started getting all the kind of interest. That you thought, no, we've done something special here. We've done something that. But even then, I would, we weren't expecting 20 years later to be sitting here. Like, not even then, I don't think. Because games, you know, they do well for a few years and then they disappear. There's plenty of franchises that mm. disappeared off the face of the earth. So the fact that Lara's kept. I don't really think it is Lara, apart from anything. I think Lara, that's um, what's kept it going. She's like a James Bond, you know, she's kept the whole thing going. I think games can be rubbish now. Maybe the next one be good, you know, just like James Bond movie. I suppose that's one of the main things because she was such an icon in terms of advertisements and it extended more than the games to movies and things like that. So it wasn't just a, a video game which came out and just disappeared you know, for that console. It actually continued and then you continued to make them and more and more. <laughs> so what, I mean, 
for you then, so you stayed the whole duration. Like what to you was the biggest change? Obviously the team grew. Um, the change, I mean, yeah, it's basically the team growing was probably the biggest thing. I mean, for the first five iterations, we, the team grew a little bit. I mean, there was a bit of a change with part of Team Raider 2 to a sort of different team. But the games weren't, they were all built on the same engine, so they were getting more advanced, but they were fundamentally all there on PlayStation 1. The big changes were the switch to uh, Age of the Darkness, where it was just a clean start. Um, and at that point, that was the biggest team that Team Raider, uh, sorry, that Core Design had ever had. It was much, much bigger. And up till then, Cora being very sort of, well, we all like all the, those of us who were there all loved it because we didn't have much interference from the management. We just made games. Um, the teams didn't have any kind of hierarchy to them. They just you know, did what they did. But all of a sudden, with the force of man team, which was huge for Cora at the time, that didn't work anymore. And it took the management a long time to realize that they couldn't just get away with the team sort of self organizing itself. And there was you know, enough different factions. The ideas were, the ambition was much bigger than the time available and so on and so forth. So suddenly, and obviously nowadays, with big games with 200, 300, 400 people on them, it needs a ton of organization because it's such a complex thing. So that was the big change, was the switch to Angel of Darkness. It suddenly became, core wasn't quite ready for it at that point. Um, obviously, it's our own doing, I How ominous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll move on to uh, Ian, who, if, if you don't know, is the director of Game City and Nottingham's NBA, which is the National Video Game Arcade. Um, being from Nottingham, and after hearing, or living in Nottingham, you work in Nottingham, your National Video Game Arcade is in Nottingham, um, how do you feel um, that Lara <laughs> is like Darby's girl, I suppose? Um, I, I, I hadn't really thought of her in, in quite those divisive frames <laughs> terms until you said it now, so now I feel a bit nervous. Um, you know, I, I think what, so, so about a decade ago when um, EM Media, who were the, the screen agency, which I think the mind on this, are the circle at the time, which is the most of course, we're looking for, um, for an identity for the region. I, like, I can't think of any other region in the country ever or possibly the world, with the exception of you know, Japan and those kind of like that, that, that's had something that been that powerful to anchor to a you know to a place. Um, and it's weird actually. You start to think about the so I spend a lot of time like banging on about the cultural or the absence of the kind of cultural confidence of games. You know, and, and I don't mean that from a desperately pretentious cultural studies point of view, but from a, like being proud of what they are, being proud of an industry in the same way that people are proud of other industries. And, you know, and it was happening here, and it was, uh, and it was happening in the British Midlands for that, you know, for that for that period. But it's only really like after the event, I think, that people, from my perspective, people really started to kind of kind of shout about it at the, at the level it needed to be. Um, it was, you know, the impact of Lara was like it's, a, it's a, like you try and think of something that famous now. You try and like really think back just how massive Lara was like at that time. Um, the moment we talk about it a bit, but 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 it was a shame it took so long for uh, uh, the like the creative industry sort of Illuminati um, to is that a white say to, like, to to acknowledge like just what a contribution um, the uh, the the, the cause he made hmm. um, um, to name a road after yeah. can you oh, imagine a whole road not even about Torvald and Dean Close <laughs> I mean that is, that is frankly not as, not as our appreciation <laughs> extends to a road um, so with that so you talk about like the impact on the local industry so that sort of brings me on to my question of the lead bomb no pressure um, you're a Derby games designer you yeah. taught game design um, you probably worked with most of the local developers, which are known apart from Core. That we've heard. I didn't actually work for Core. No, no. not not Core. No. Um, what am I doing here? Um, <laughs> how he worked on that evil? And James James Pond. Yeah, that's it, that's it with games. So, um, how have you seen sort of Laura's impact on the local industry? So you you worked in it from other perspectives. Like for you, this game comes out. You're local as well like what did you think and well it's interesting because i i actually wasn't in derby when it came out um, oh. <laughs> um i i got into games in 91 i think 
um, I started a little studio just uh, just in Ripley, not, not far down the road, and there were three of us above a garage um, making making James Bond games. Um, and I think it was around the time of sort of when PlayStation One was a, a, sort of about to come out, we realised that we were little fish in a very big pond and we couldn't afford the, the sort of dev kits for PS1. Um, and so around that time I had a look around what my options were sort of locally and I, it's, it's weird I put it up with that. I hadn't really seen Core making that leap to 3D. Uh, I'd seen they'd done a, you know, sort of a few two, 2D games. Um, and uh, and I, I, I moved to Sony in Cambridge uh, where I learned 3D down there uh, and worked on medieval games uh, when I lived in Cambridge. And it was only when I moved back to Derby, probably about 1998, something like that. Um, uh, and I was I moved to Eurocon, so I was sort of near you know, the opposite side of the, the, the street then as well. Um, and then you really realised that you know, that, uh, that had a huge impact on that company and really turned them into a, a big player. Um, and, and I'm not sure why. I don't know. I, I never really considered. Thinking of throwing a calling court because I really should have done at the time. <laughs> if I, you know, I, I'd probably regret not calling court. And, you know, instead of going to Sony, I should have called court call and uh, tried to get a job there. I suppose, just leading from that, is that with a hindsight to see how much of an icon it's become, though? Because, yeah, absolutely. You yeah. know, if let's just say, you know, James Bond continues to grow and grow and grow, yeah, you we could be excited to imagine James Bond exactly twenty years of James Bond <laughs> longer. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's sort of now. Yeah. <laughs> but that sort of comes back to it because sort of Gavin, you joined. Was it about the time that di- this was before the game had come out? So you were sort of at the start of that process for Tomb Raider. Looking back at it, core beforehand, was what sort of drew you to it then? What drew me to core? Yeah. Yeah. Me a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, actually, at that time, I think core didn't have that great a reputation, to be honest. It was kind of, they've done a lot of smallish games, but, you know, they kind of had a mixed reputation, I think, at the time. But I was coming out of university, and I sent off a, you know, a CV to a few places, and called the ones. When I came to see it, they were my father's friend in this company. Um, whereas I went to St. Gremlin up in Sheffield, and they were talking about, oh yeah, you know, for the first six months, you sit there and do high school tables. What I'll be doing. Um, so Paul just seemed a very friendly company and that's what drew me to them. That's so um, and Ian, so with the National Video Game Arcade, um, you're very much up to date on the culture of video games. That's really your what it's about, the culture. Um, would you say that Tomb Raider as a game itself do you think the progression of the games now is often better? So now, for, I know, it's a weird way to ask that question. So in terms of what, as the character has progressed, so Lara, you know, we have to admit, was quite sexualized at the start, well, it's assumed to be. Do you think that's gotten better now? This is a new one, so she's not. Um, I, are you asking me a question about whether I think Lara's more or less sexualized. Um, yes. I don't want to try answer the right yes, question. Yes, I'm yes, to yes. It. That is the but, question. But honestly, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know how to answer that. But like I was, I was talking, I was doing a uh, BBC. There, there's been a lot of 20th anniversary Tomb Raider, and, and a lot of people answer the question: Would well, your breasts get progressively bigger over the first three iterations? Why do you think about that? And like, you know, yeah, probably, and to some extent, depending on which. Hat you have on, like that's probably like maybe that maybe that's possibly a problem. But then I don't think, like you look at all advertising ever for anything in you know West capitalism, and it's pretty sexualized. And then Lara was more than a piece of advertising, like, like obviously, right? But the, the problem that like Lara had and the core had, or I got certain perhaps more, was that she, like she was like she was. Massive. I mean, this is at the same time, like, you complain about Lara being sexualized. This is at the same time as the Spice Girls. Do you know what I mean? Like, this was the same period we got the Tories out. It's new name and called Britannia and the Spice Girls and Lara's Aid. And, like, you forget, it's it's 20 years ago, and you sort of forget, like, quite what momentum that was at the time. Like, Douglas Cookman was writing books about Lara Croft, you know? Like, the, the soft drinks are being renamed after this was like the, the momentum and weight behind Lara at that time like there's been nothing like it 
like for any like any kind of image uh, representing the games, it's taken fifteen years for Sackboy to turn up and now be the thing that people put on, you know, the the, the, the sort of poster child for for, for, for British games. Um, You'll notice I've ducked your question about whether I think, but uh, only, I, I'm only doing this because I know. Cause only, well, only because I don't know how to answer it. it. It's like you know, it's like trying to measure the sexual politics of like a '70s sitcom against mm. what people write down, and, and it's just not fair. You know, to leading do on from what you just said, I found the same because for this event, that lots of people have asked me that question have gone, did you think that the character was sexualized? And I was like, I was five and six at the time. So to answer your question, no. Um, and I've never been able to see it in that way because I grew up with it. And I, for some of you may have heard of this, but um, for me, I used to, my school was on Ashbourne Road. We used to walk past um, Core Design and my mum would go, that's where Laura lives. And to a young boy, you have no idea you go there, um, it just doesn't look as grand as what's portrayed in the games. Um, and you know, it's more of a family thing. We used to play the games with my dad, he would play what well, we could hinder him. And, you know, we'd say, Dad, go up there, and he'd probably die. Um, but that's what it was for me. She never was this sort of, I'm never able to see it, I suppose. But then I suppose that leads on to Gavin answering the question of, Do you think she was sexualized? Yeah, she was the way I asked, yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing that we talked about when those of us who were on the project originally, we didn't think of it like that. You know, she was just carried in this game and she ran around reading tunes. Yes, she was made out in a kind of fairly sexy way, but you know, it's just the same with every male character, it's always butch and manly and all the rest of it, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, but it was really I was marketing who latched on to the fact that this was a big deal with this character and they would they put it on the front of the box, you know, starring Lara Croft or introducing Lara Croft, whatever they put. At the time we were like, well that's a bit strange because no one has heard of this character, it's only just come out. Um, but they'd really they'd obviously seen that this was going to be a big deal. And then they pushed it like crazy. And then while we were making Tomb Raider 2, that's when it all went, you know, huge the face, which is a big mega the inside and stuff on the front. Which was totally weird, a computer game character on the front of this magazine. And then of course I like, kind of churning out and it was a bit weird during her into sort of images of her in a swimsuit and things like that, which didn't fit the game character at all. And I certainly had conversations at the time with people who didn't play the game. We thought, oh, you work on that kind of porny game. It's like, no, 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 it's not like that. Because they just took this, they, all they saw was the media thing. Where every, as you say, every kind of interview we had at that time, it was always, if they were outside the games industry, they were straight all over that side of it, you know, about Lara as a sort of, you know, woman rather than an actual character in a game. So, yeah, what am I saying? I'm not sure why. I'm answering your <laughs> questions. Yeah, I think you've answered the question, <laughs> which is good. We'll go back to you, Mandy. Um, for you, because you teach, you talk game design at Derby Uni. Um, how important is the older games to learning? Because you know, with something like Tomb Raider, it's, it is iconic. And I suppose when you, that's what your students sort of aspired to yeah. to go for. So, what is the importance of looking back at the older stuff which was made and then going, "Well, this happened." You could, you know, is there an importance there? I don't know. I, I think I, there was one point in, in teaching where they asked if, if we could introduce a history element to, to the modules we were doing, and, and I, I didn't really see the relevance, to be honest. It, you're teaching, <clears throat> at the end of the day, you're teaching kind of skills, you're teaching anatomy, um, and, and my, my particular module was, was purely art based. Um, and so for me, I, I, I wanted to be able to, you know, sort of teach kids how to make kids make, make games that are, you know, graphics that look current, um, and so therefore learning the current skills, um, I guess covering a little bit of, of what we were doing back in the day, we, you know, you do that a little bit, you talk about perhaps how you, how you did things um, back then, but, but now it was more about trying to cram in a lot of information uh, as to how we make games now, um, and, and, you know, I think with, with the new, the new sort of the rise of the Tomb Raider, I've been playing recently on PS4, and, uh, and the, the graphics in that game are just, just stunning. They're, they're really. And, and going back to the, the sexualization thing, I, I, I was always quite uncomfortable actually with the way she looked. But, you know, I, I think where the weather at now is is actually a better place. I think in terms of being a role model um, type character and, um, and and also a little bit more realistic in terms of the type of clothes she's wearing in you know Arctic environments. So really random. 
uh, or vest top, she's actually wearing you know, sort of a, a parka and things like that. Yeah, dressing up and don't get sensible, I guess. Would you agree, Gavin? <laughs> I think it's true, but um, obviously, Lara is also a product of the actual technology we had at the time. Toby designed her an out that was very much based around the fact because she was made out of separate parts. We didn't even do skin in back then. So, she likes to have polish for a park. Yeah. No. But, but anyway, so, yeah, so he designed her, to, her outfit and stuff. You know, she had a little backpack that she wears. It would just cover the seams of her shoulders and things like that. Um, still, and it was kind of the in outfit at that sort of time. The girls were wearing kind of shorts. I kind of came back in again recently for that was kind of very in, you know, people talk about Spice Girls, that was kind of thing they were wearing at the time. So, she was definitely a product of her time. And we'll go to Ian. Same, similar sort of question there. So, for you looking back, because you've suffered the National Video Game Arcade, there's obviously yeah. the, the, you, you appreciate the industry as a whole, um, as everyone here does. Um, what is the importance of looking back and rather just going, your yeah, games have gone so great now? You know, is the that sort of value? Do we should we look back? Yeah, I mean, you, you don't know where you're honest. But you know where you've been, right? Um, I, 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 and I think you know there's, there's a sort of culture under that, and, and there's a there's a I think from a design point of view, the progression of what like just the get like the game did from a design point of view, just beginning to nudge of like big uh, three dimensional worlds could be explored, and if, like in a feeling of like freedom of doing that with some of the two really was really but it felt really new, I think, for a mainstream sort of audience. And but I think we have a lot of school trips coming to the NBA, and um, the thing that upsets all the kids. Is how difficult games <laughs> pre. I mean, certainly like in the eighties, but actually like Tomb Raider one, I think at least it's, it's really hard. <laughs> like it's like it remind it's like uh, manic minor level of accuracy in some of the platforms and stuff. Yeah, I, mean, if I, I didn't feel like that at the time. Though. No, I remember the time was better. I went like to play it like because it was coming here, and um, it's really difficult the whole thing stuff. Um, not in a like a flawed way at all, but you couldn't like we have kids come to the, to the NBA and play uh, and play Tomb Raider, play uh, like level one of Donkey Kong stuff like that, and they can't they they're in mean, like tears, but like but they, they would be if they weren't you know the, 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 seeing that balancing of difficulty change over over the years. I mean, it's lots of things change, you know, but but that's a, a thing you can really notice. You really have a sense of a sort of arc of that, you know. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important to. Um, to, 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 to look at the kind of the, the journey of this stuff, and it, and that's not about just the graphics getting better. You know, that's the, the, in some respects for me, that's like the least interesting thing. Really, there's, there's a whole there's a whole load of other stuff that's happening around me too. Okay, um, thank you, the three of you. It was, it was very good. Um, <laughs> so I think it's quite talk about maybe some of like I'd like what each of you sort of like your favourite moment, like something which really stands out. Which you were happy when you were at Core Design, not to put you on the spot. Uh, that is sad uh, to put me on the spot. Uh, with Tomb Raider, I think the best moments of Tomb Raider games, in all honesty, was finishing them, getting them <laughs> out of the door, and getting them done. They were very interesting projects to work on, as most of them are. But they were also we were under a huge amount of pressure to deliver large titles with you know all the commercial kind of aspects and. Uh, behind them and we had to get them done and we had very small time frames to get them done in so ultimately it was that feeling of like relief when you got it out of the door and it was out of the way. Thank you. Uh, well, I think I have to echo <laughs> a lot of what Alex said so for sure it was a very um, strict timeline but I think once you'd, you'd adapted to that you could enjoy the details so I think some of the favourite bits for me was with the storytelling animation starting from the storyboard and working with the team and getting the buy-in of you know what we're actually going to do. But then when it got to stage where involved Nathan with the music and it suddenly it added another dimension to what I was doing and thinking, wow, this actually now feels quite real. And I think when we really finished one, you felt brilliant. I know there's another four to do, and back to what Alex said. <laughs> but that was really, really exciting moments for me. I uh, um I think the whole experience for me was fantastic. I agree with Alex. We had some great sort of at, again launch parties, didn't we, in the guide as the core. Um, but the main the better memories for me really was just the everyday working environment. It was very, very creative. Um, it was nice to be with the buzz of, of creative people around you. Um, 
and very inspiring. Uh, it drove you on. And um, the, the product that we actually creating was a pleasure to work on as well. Yeah, it was something I haven't done before. So yeah, I'm definitely say just a general day to day life of course was good for me. The work we did was fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, it, it's um, the team at Core were, were like a family, really, and you know they made me feel so welcome after Cherry's the first voice. They made me feel so welcome. Um, but a lot of the work, was, like I said, was very serious. I had to be out at a certain time, and you know it's very full. But at the same time, I had really got from my outtakes. <laughs> you know, even though it was, it was all. You know, hard work and getting studio time in and, and, and doing all, all the voiceover work. But at the same time, we, you know, we did have a laugh and I did learn a lot and I'm, I'm proud it was in my life, really. Um, I mean, very iconic voice you played. And some, some have said the best. So it was just an accolade which is good to hang on to. Um, Thank you. Do you find that when people are meeting, I mean, people have met you today, is it is it strange that people are so sort of like, Overwhelmed by seeing you and sort of speaking. Yeah, to you. It, it, it's yeah because because I like did the two games and of course it's come so far now. And you've got you know Jamal and and Kiwi and all the rest did a lot more than me. I feel that they're sort of like Laura more than I was Laura, but then they say to me, "No, but you were kind of the second and I don't know. It's, it it kind of makes me think a bit more about it about what I actually did, whereas before it was kind of. Even at the time, see, at the time I wasn't allowed to tell anybody that I was actually doing the voice, so I was always hidden away in a cupboard or next to a microphone somewhere, and nobody kind of knew. So I didn't really um, express myself much then. It's more in later years, and people have, you know, fans, fans actually, that, that have given me, you know, um, all these lovely comments and, and, and feedback from 20 years ago. So I suppose it's the same for everyone here when people find out that you've worked on a Tomb Raider. They, there must be that sort of like, oh, like, what was it like? Tell me more about it. Is it sort of similar feelings, sort of like a, a joy? And there's a mic there next to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, I've got a 13 year old at school who's just appreciating computer games now. <laughs> um, and she name drops very occasionally. But um, I have said to her, you do know when you say one works on Tomb Raider, you're most likely going to get. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. You know, because uh, it's just, especially a mum that works on Tomb Raider as well. Um, but um, no, I agree with what Judith was saying earlier. We, we were very much um, cosseted and, and, and wrapped up at core in what we were doing. We certainly didn't get any opportunity to talk to fans. We weren't the face of the game. Um, and it's really only re over the last couple of weeks, in all honesty, from the Games Expo that my lovely friend over there, Ash, organised in Manchester, that we've just had the opportunity to address fans in, in 20 years uh, and say to people, you know, it's not about who we are, it's the fact that you appreciated what we did means a lot, really. And for people to come up to you and say, you know, Either Tomb Raider changed my life and you hear some really amazing heartwarming stories or it was just a good game to play it means a lot to me because and all the team really because we didn't know how we were getting in touch with the general public we had no concept that we'd arrived in somebody's living room and been part of their lives and when Peter which is quite because you work currently you, you know, you're we're all we're all sort of in the industry in some ways but with yourself like when People, your um, other young graphic designers um, ask you, like, oh, what, what, what are your credits when you tell them Tomb Raider? Are they against the all the younger people than anyone in the industry, really? Um, when I joined a company uh, called Blitz Game Studios in Leamington, it was about uh, six years ago, you had to introduce yourself by sending, you fill in a form and it gets sent round to everyone to tell you who you are. and, and it was, it's one of those cringe worthy things you have to write something embarrassing about yourself or games you've worked on. And um, I got a few emails and it was interesting, it was a certain age group of people who said, oh, I was I was eight or I was 12 and I can't believe you worked on that game. And it was one of those things where you just thought, wow, that's, that's amazing that you had this impact or the game had this impact. And <clears throat> certainly, you know, there's definitely a generational thing that people who grew up with something like that will have a stronger bond with that thinking adult life, which probably means 
that the brand would probably then resonate with another generation. And continues to do so. Um, and with you, Alex, uh, I remember when we met before, I think it was a while ago, but I just thought it might be worth bringing you up Core Designs, Tomb Raider, and the Anniversary. The game. Ah, yes. yes. Um, there's the mic. So I don't know if many of you here know, but while we have Crystal Dynamics version of the Anniversary game, there was actually a Core Design Anniversary game in the works. And Alex will explain what happened. The Anniversary project, the project I think, was always very speculative because at the time it was, I think, it is going back quite a while now, but it was just after IDOS had sold Core to Rebellion. And the idea was that we would put together, um, using the assets and the systems that we already had, we put together a remake of the first game's anniversary edition and kind of almost present it to either as a phase of complete, like, check this out, look what we've done. Unfortunately, I think politically for them, it was something they could never do. They just got rid of Core and, hey, check this game out, look what they've done. Oh, no, well, we, we can't possibly release this. So. I think the only reason people ever got wind of it was because um, the game got leaked. I don't know who leaked it, um, but it made it out and things. And at this point, IDOS then, well, effectively had to commission Crystal to do their own anniversary edition. Um, so it was quite a weird one. We worked on uh, a remake of the first game using up-to-date technology. It was it was really good. And we were really pleased with what we'd done, and it was a lot more relaxed than a lot of the other Tomb Raider projects because there was no pressure. It wasn't the like, you've got to get this out in two months time, otherwise everybody's, you know, sort of the whole thing's going down. It's like, uh, let's knock something together, play around with it a bit, make it look nice, make it control nice. And um, yeah, that was a story. It never got finished, never got released, unfortunately, which is a shame because I know a lot of people really like the look of the videos. I think the, the version that Crystal did was very good because Crystal are an extremely capable company. But uh, yeah, it was something that it would have been nice to finish, but we never did. And all, uh, if you were interested in seeing footage of that, it's all on YouTube, very available, you know, to see. Um, well, I suppose with yeah, being part of this 20th anniversary and being back in Derby, I mean, some of you are local or not, but is it weird that you're here now, there's this whole audience of people, and you're, you're celebrities, you're the other people that they came to see you, is, this, is it a bit of pressure? I don't know about that. I mean, the thing is, with, with working on the games, for me, whatever game I worked on, it's always been my old thing, it's the best job I can, you know, get it out of the door on time. That's always the kind of underlying thing, but that doesn't mean you're rushing it. You want to get it out the best quality you can uh, and do the best job you can working with the people around you um, in, in the time you have. So, in a lot of respects, working on Tomb Raider, it was just another game. I mean, yeah, we knew it was huge, we knew it was iconic, and we... You do have a reasonable idea about how big it is, but you never... I, I even have that... I can't remember. I've seen clips of the, uh, the Leaf and Loaded documentary. I've never seen it all the way through. Mm. I've never fancied seeing it all the way through. <laughs> um, and, and you get an idea of just how huge it is, but... When you're working on it, like uh, as I said, you know you are slightly cosseted to an extent. You know you're, you're kept away from from the public mm. largely because you've got some horrendous deadline to meet, and you know that's just going to kind of mess things up. But uh, yeah, it's it's quite strange seeing the impact it's had and continues to have. Mm. You know, I think we got a bit of a sense of it with with, with some of the Lucasade advertising and things like that. That would be a bit of a yeah. yeah. With a bit of cognitive dissonance, we see one of those ads come up. Hang on a second, this, this, this is just weird. So, most of the time, we tune it out, but yeah, it's, inter on. it's interesting to bring up the documentary because I was going to ask Peter and Heather what, what they thought. Because when you see those images, which they change, like, does that I imagine it upsets you? But that's what you worked on. But again, I saw when I was watching it, it's the scene which I absolutely hate that scene. It's just the one bit of documentary where it gets to me, but which bit yeah. not? That's the scene. The, 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 the All right, okay. That, <laughs> that, that doesn't bother me. Vince, Vince and James. And that's the really weird thing because the people got very protective over Lara Croft. Um, the thing is, I could understand where marketing went to a degree. That's something that's out of your control. <laughs> Uh, you just have to look at marketing in general. If you try and sell sugar puffs, 
you end up with something like a honey monster to the sun. <laughs> and if you look at how far removed advertising is from the actual product that they're selling, you've got to allow for that freedom within that industry. Um, and I know it's something that upset Toby, as he mentioned in the, in the film briefly, um, but for me, I concentrated more on uh, the game itself. My life revolved around the game. Lara, even Lara to a degree was a little out of reach for me because, because I was a level designer and more interested in the architecture of the game. And um, I can remember when it was released, people talking about Lara Croft and getting a bit sort of, no, oh, you mean Tomb Raider? No, no, Lara Croft, Lara Croft. No, no, it's Tomb Raider, it's a game, it's not a person. And I couldn't get my head around that for a long time. And certainly over the second and third Tomb Raiders, when we were getting interviewed, uh, most of the interviews were, were, go, were geared towards Lara. And it was bizarre watching that documentary, the things like Gordon Stone being involved, and, uh, you know, and some woman dressing up as Lara. And to me, that all just seems so surreal because when we worked on a game, the storyline at the time was secondary to the game. The game was about, let's pick some great locations. So you'd be watching a Sky Documentary channel about a Chinese province and a great emperor that had a mystical tomb, which would drive a whole load of ideas then for exploration in the game. Or yeah, the obvious ones, Egypt, let's do Greece. So the ideas for the levels came before the stories. The ideas of Lara and what she should do became, came before she had history, before she had a story. So this was the stuff that was asked us towards the end of Tomb Raider 1 and was kind of bolted in. Let's, you know, let's get it in there. Let's give Lara a life. And to me, I could never get my head around that. And there's a lot of very early interviews with me. Um, and some guy saying, so, you know, what do you think of Lara? I'm like, well, she's just a game character. <laughs> you want to think of her, she's not real. Yeah. Uh, so I've never made that jump from people seeing her as a real character. It's interesting you say that because <laughs> Judith earlier showed me some newspaper cuttings. <laughs> now, would you like to, ex can you explain to everyone here what these, this, the particular one I'm on about is the yeah. comparison? Yeah, they did, um, when, when it leaked out to the press, obviously, because I was not allowed to tell everybody who I was. As, like, even on the games, it says many thanks. It doesn't actually say voice of Laura. Um, but anyway, this, this particular um, newspaper article um, had Laura's vital statistics with her photograph, and my vital statistics, what, she, what car she drove, what car I drove, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. <laughs> so yeah, and that was sort of after what you said, um, Heather, about you know Laura being that person. The fact that you had national papers sort of going, this is the real Laura. Like there's an expose, like yeah, oh, that, but the real. But yeah, obviously, yeah. people didn't want to look at me as as the real Laura because there's nothing like it was that. Like it was so yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose um, again, Heather, when you're talking, you remind me of a story Peter told me. So Peter. Textures and games. Um, when you were looking to get um, a certain look, and uh, you were talking to me about like this journey of going back to the bookshop, a local bookshop, and scouring through all the um, various ones to choose on. So, so to, I think that would be quite interesting just to explore. Okay, yeah, I guess one of the things about the 20th anniversary thing is you know, you think back to you know, computers of the internet at that point, and, and most people didn't have the internet, and if they did, it was with a dial-up phone connection. And for us to get reference, we, we basically went to the library in Derby, and on Saturday, there was a, an independent bargain bookshop, and I'd say to the head of New York, said, oh, have you, been, have you seen that book they've got on there? I've got this one on the uh, walls. And I've got this one called Desk, and it was only 3 dollars <laughs> And we go through, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, you, this sort of thing's incredibly frowned upon in terms of the legal side of games yeah. and, and rights and, and things like that. And, I've had a lot of training since then. He knows better. But um, things gradually changed when we started to use the internet, but even then it was, well, there was no Google image search. No. So finding imagery and you know, search terms were just not as good as, as they are now. Um, I think it was around about two, maybe three, where we suddenly went, 
digital cameras, this is amazing. You can go back and take photos of things, and that's where we, um, you know, we started to reference the world around us, or you know, go for trips and, and look for things. And I remember going to Power Sports in Derby, which was closed, you know, several years ago, and we got out. Well, because we knew someone who worked there, managed to get out loads of kind of winter gear and photograph it all, and it all ended up as part of the reference for the costumes in the, the intro for Two Mega Three. Um, and that was just like a gradual transition, and you know, probably within about you know, five years, say, you know, say fifteen years ago, um, that workflow of using the internet and using digital cameras had just become normal to us. But the, the beginnings were very humble. Um, and it was interesting earlier. It's been fantastic listening to you all uh, throughout the day. But one thing that was said that I found really interesting it was never really explained, and that was that the current Lara, especially the look. The current Lara isn't Lara. Now, what? What? I know. I know. It probably wasn't you guys who said it, but what do you think was meant by that, and, and why do you think kind of the crystal dynamics, the current rise of the zoom rate Lara is not Lara? <laughs> Who's got more? <laughs> Can I go? Um, I'd say that the characters involved a little bit. Like what Lee once said, it's a lot to do with the technology, and then also to do with the the appetite for how characters are probably represented in games now. So she's a little bit more photo realistic, but designed to be a bit more believable. So she's her clothes are always dirty and she's got a few scratches and cuts and things like that. Whereas I think when Tomb Raider started and certainly the early core design games, she very much lived in a cartoon world and I think the games now are very much in a real world. I think I could add to that say this Games back then required a lot more suspension of disbelief, and largely because of the technology. But I think that's something that appealed to me back then. You know, you could, from a, a very simple construct, you had something that could take you into this kind of imaginary world. Whereas now, the imaginary world is, wow, you know, rendered in incredible high detail, everything like that. So I think, as uh, the requirement for suspension of disbelief is lessened. You know the characters are going to change and become more rounded and more natural with it. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. Um, from my perspective, I don't think it is going to play games a lot less. Other people might disagree, but yeah, that's what I think. Uh, now that we're into 2016 and we're into pretty high-end consoles and completely different Tomb Raiders than what was original Tomb Raider, do you feel quite protective over your original Tomb Raider? No, I can't, certainly I don't feel protective. I think things have got to move on, and I'm just pleased that they're using Tomb Raider, they're still creating Tomb Raider to games, um, updating Lara, updating their story. We, it would have been sad if by the time Tomb Raider 3 was completed, that was it. It would have just been a distant memory, but at least now we've got some something of a legend to say that we're part of, and that's wonderful. I just hope it continues. Um, I think you know, for me it was just, you know, like what Heather was saying, it was it was great to be a part of something like that. But by the end of the fourth game, a bit like what Alex was saying earlier about the fatigue of turning these things around and are repetitive, I'm not going to have a summer holiday um, every year. But then you know, like, I want to, you know, we're creative people and you think I want to have a challenge to do something different. And, and what I found was a little bit like, say, Crystal's journey, making a game now. I've worked on games where it's had a Disney character or you know other things like that, and I feel like that's great just to have a go at something else every now and again, and you take on someone else's work, and I think that's that's kind of quite a healthy thing, and it's it's really nice to. I went to the Games Expo in Birmingham last year, and I saw this giant, you know, kind of thirty foot high poster for Rise of Tomb Raider, and I thought, wow, that's great that that's still going, and someone's doing it, and, and it's still a big event, and it's nice to know that I could still have a summer holiday. So. <laughs> It's like Pete said, you, you move on, um, you, know, you finish it, you move on, and change is always good, especially when you've been doing it for as long as we have, so it's always nice to work on new things. It's nice to see that it's still going, but I think I've moved on, I think to most other people have as well. But yeah, I've got much to add to that. I mean, I was protective at the time, I felt protective about the camera at the time and things like that, but once we've moved on, we've moved on, so there we go. Hi, uh, um, he was a, a fan, really, uh, I've got every single one. Uh, I was just wondering how much influence you had or how much input you had regarding the music 
to the game, which was a huge part. When I started playing, it could terrify me when I was 10, which was when, I, when it first came out. Um, so I just wondered how much influence you had on that side of it. Um, we didn't, none of the ones, none of the people on this stage. Um, that was Nathan McRae and uh, Miles Knight and um, Pete Conley. They were musicians and they pretty much, uh, yeah. 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 So they used to come down to us, they'd look at the levels that were being made by Heather and Neil and the situations and they'd suddenly come down and go, look, I've got this bit, this, this is where it's good. And they'd tell us where they wanted it triggered in the level and what was going to happen. Oh, we've got this bit of music we composed. And we saw Nathan talking a couple of weeks ago at the yeah, Manchester thing, he was pointing out, which I didn't realise at the time, that uh, Tomb Raider 1 had a very small amount of music in it actually. And they were all a couple of minutes long, whereas Tomb Raider 2 you composed much longer pieces. And they were far, you know, and he had lots of different ones in just particular situations because he had the chance to do that. Um, but very much it was his uh, his thing. The musicians did their bit of the job, and we just went, oh, yeah, okay, true right here, then. There we go. Uh, so, like to what Gaz said, creatively, we had pretty much zero input other than saying I like the sound of that. But the only thing that we did was programmers anyway was put constraints on what the musicians could do. You know, you can't have that much memory, you can't do this, you can't do this, which it's not a particularly creative role, but I guess it kind of the constraints it put on them made them they produced very, very good work under some pretty tight constraints. Um, so say that was any kind of creative input, that's what we did. That's about as far as it goes. Yeah, so yeah, there was one of the amazing things about it when those games were being made, and it's not something I've experienced with every game I've worked on, is the music was always exceptionally good immediately. But there was, wasn't really a lot of iteration. Like whenever you heard something in the game, you were just like, that's amazing, and it sounds so authentic, or it added you know, so much weight to the game. And certainly with the cinematic stuff that I was doing with Nathan, I felt like he finished off my work for me. Where well, sometimes I'd think, well, maybe this animation is not that good here. And you know, they do the music, and I'd go, Wow, that suddenly made that better. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I definitely agree with Peter. Um, being the level designer, yeah, we talked to the musicians and we showed them a room that he instantly get a sensation of whether it should be dark, moody music or whether it should be icy and cold, and and, um, and let them take it from there, let them run with it. But I know exactly what you're saying because it'd be the moments that you put a piece of music into your level or or a certain sound effect, for instance, that it was the final touch, that it brought the level to life. It wasn't a silent movie anymore. It had more um, strength to it and certainly more emotion to the levels. And some sets that I walked into that were just a piece of architecture until um, there was some atmosphere created there with that extra touch of the music. Uh, good question, really. And Judith, yeah. <laughs> just to add to that, Judith, Sorry. I see you trying to get rid of the mic. Did, did you um, have any of the music to go by, sort of, to get your get you to understand what was going on in the scene, or were you just left to your own devices to say the lines? No, I didn't really have. All I had was pages of the script. I didn't have like um, this is what's going to happen now. But Nathan actually used to say to me, "This is what's going to happen now," and it's going to be la 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 or whatever sort of thing. But um, no, I didn't. So basically, I just had the script and uh, quite a, just a general sort of, well, this is what she's going to do now, and this is what's going to happen now. But I did work quite closely with Nathan sometimes because I'd go and I'd say, well, let me listen to it, you know, on my own time sort of thing. And, and yeah, so I did, I did get a, a little bit of a peek, but obviously not, not a say at all. <laughs> um, we have another question. Hey guys, um, just massive fan here as well. Um, I'm actually from Italy, so I played them all in Italian up to five, so Laura sounded very different <laughs> to me. Um, but yeah, I have an Angel of Darkness question. Um, obviously, when things didn't quite go as planned, um, was it like a, a fight to still kind of like keep Tomb Raider, or did it just kind of like fizzle out? I think we knew when when Angel of Darkness was finished, um, that pretty much core, as, as a company, the two mode was done. Um, 
there have been a few other things going on in the background, I can't say so much, but we, we knew that we were under enormous amounts of pressure from multiple directions to get it done. Um, and it was, yeah, we finished it, and we, we pretty much knew we wouldn't be doing another two major game, which is a real shame. And I, I think with Angel of Darkness, there was a real sense that a bit, I mean, it's, it was a long time ago, so thinking back, I remember it was always kind of like, oh, it's going to be another couple of months, I've been delayed against another couple of months. And I think that constant drip, drip, drip of small delays that began a lot of harm, I think if they turned around and said, right, yeah, it's not where it wants to be, we're going to be eight months, and then we're there, I think giving it a bit more breathing space, we could have done we could have done a lot more with it. And I think the big problem is, is it wasn't finished. We released it and it was it was incomplete, which was really frustrating for the amount of work that went into it. Because the bits that were complete looked looked really good. And I think just going back to uh, the, the audio question, one of the things that you get when you're working on a game like that is when something like the audio comes in or when you see the completed graphics or completed dressing for a level, you get a real sort of, oh, that looks really good, oh, yeah, I like that, that looks really nice, that sounds really good, and it feels it comes together. And we had a lot of that with Angel of Darkness. You know, there were some of the, some of the levels when they were put together, when they, I think the nightclub one was, was a particular one that I really liked, it, kind of like, oh, it looks really, really good. So there was a lot of Angel of Darkness that we were really pleased with, it's just that, you know, you know, yeah, it went a bit wrong at the end, it wasn't finished, and uh, yeah, we, I think we pretty much knew that it was done. I don't think anybody really had any fight left in them at the end to kind of say, no, we want to carry on doing Tomb Raider. So, yeah, that answers your question. Yeah. And who did the upper outfits for Laura Croft? I think I assume what like, like, designed it or did the drawings. Who, who designed? Who, who are you, by the way? What, what can I ask you? Is you a fan? Peter's son. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you've asked. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think um, in the original game, Laura just had a costume, and I think it was only when we, um, we got to Tomb Raider 2, I think as I remember it, we started to think of a context of how she could change. Um, I seem to remember it in, sometimes it was more like a situation led to it, so I think in Tomb Raider 2 she stole the boat plane and there happened to be a flying jacket which was really handy because she crashed it into there and it was snowing. So it was the beginning of her having some more functional wardrobe I think and then I guess that was uh, part of how it started as we, we thought about what would make sense but it was kind of like a group decision. I think it was only one time where we had something forced upon us which was I think Jeremy knew someone who ran solar wetsuits and said it would yeah. be a really good idea if Laura wore a solar wetsuit in Tomb Raider 2 when she climbs out of the water and that was it. But I think otherwise it was uh, it was more led from the overall story and the level design than we said what makes sense in this location. Um, I'm here as a fan but also someone who's in the games industry locally. I run social media for Rare down in Toy Cross. Oh, yeah. Very likely to them down there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, as a gamer and a woman in the industry, I just kind of, it was partly a thank you for creating such an iconic female character. And I was just wondering if any of you share my frustration that there aren't more game series with strong female characters. I worked at Rare for five or six years before I went up to call. Oh, yeah. Which game did you work on? Bubble Bath Toad series. Ah, yeah. Bit of Donkey Kongs. <laughs> I'll tell some of the old crowd, please say hi then. There's still some there, they haven't left yet. Uh, Paul McIntyre can keep order still there. Oh dear god. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with Paul actually on quite a few of his earlier games, I'll say no more. Um, no, do give them my regards, oh. but um, actually Rare's a good contrast. If we're not talking so much about female characters, can I just get you back to how things work in the industry? Because you've picked up on a good point. Um, I know when Gaz said that he came to Core, he experienced a really friendly, open environment when he arrived, and that was one of the reasons that he took the job there. Now, when I left Care, uh, Core, uh, sorry, Rare, to come to Core, I found them two very, very different environments. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think that Lara would have ever been developed at Rare, and that's no disrespect from for Rare at all. 
It's just that within the country at the time, a lot of development houses had a very fixed idea of who a, um, a game's character should be or a hero should be. And they believed, and I'm sure they used some sort of market appraisal to find these figures, that men just wouldn't want to play female character. And that was it. And there was no question, no diversity. Keep to what the new word, keep everything safe. Uh, and what was refreshing about Core was the fact that they did take the risks and and opened the uh, were open to ideas about having a female character. So it's I don't think it's so much as why isn't there more girls in the industry or why why isn't there more female characters in the industry. I think it's more about um, when you're creating a game. There's a lot of money invested into it, and a lot of people don't want to take risks on something that isn't the norm sometimes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My question is about the cutscenes, which are, were impressive for their time. Did any of you, were, how, how were the cut, these, the cutscenes in between the gameplay, how were they manufactured? Do you, do you know? Can I give that to you? Uh, job. Yeah, so, so basically that was my job. Um, I guess we, like Toby's vision was always, it was going to be a very cinematic game. Um, and what he did that really helped was he, um, he storyboarded a lot of it. And then eventually that, that kind of got passed on to me. Um, we then hired a, a script writer, Vicky, who helped um, us to kind of really flesh out what we're doing with the story. Um, but from storyboard, we followed a, a very much a, a traditional, I guess, film production pipeline. I'd had some training in video production before I came to the company. I think that was part of the reason they hired me was, well, they didn't tell me at the time was, by the way, we think you know about this, so you're going to do it. And I thought, well, I'd better convince them I do know how to do this. So I'll do all the things that I've heard people talking about, and then I'll, I'll do those things. So, it would be things like I would take a drawn storyboard and produce what's called an animatic where you um, you cut that together in timing and you might have a voice track to go with that. So I'd work with the musicians so we'd have voices, um, you know, from depending on which game. So some of that would be um, Judith's work and we would be like, right, now we have our timing track for, for what's being said when. And then we'd use uh, commercial 3D software and we spent a lot of time making things um, lighting it, animating it, and then quite often blowing it up. Um, but that was always a time pressure, and we had to just learn how to just try and do things efficiently and quickly. And I think I was talking to someone today where, in one of the sequences, I started to do a thing where sometimes the person talking might be off camera and you would show the person's reaction because it was quicker to animate them than to animate the person talking. And I think we, you know, gradually over time, we just worked out what is the most two made a moment we could do and put all the effort into the really dramatic bit and less so into the more you know mundane things but it was uh it was a learning curve and hopefully by sort of team raider fourth the quality has sort of really stepped up but i think at that point we realized that with just a few people doing it it was too much work and um we basically paid uh, a company in paris called ex machina to, to do the work and i think suddenly that raised a lot of eyebrows as to how expensive that work was that we'd managed to sort of model through for so many years, just by being creative about what work we did to try and get a, a high quality. I wanted to ask in Tomb Raider 1, near the end of the game, there's these levels that I can only describe as like kind of like muscly and meaty. Oh. And they were so awesome. I was just wondering how you got the inspiration oh, to make those. Tell anybody that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were the highest part of that. Yeah, so my wife out there is, um, works as a pathologist. And she has all these books full of uh, anatomy and bits of body and things. And I took one of them into work because these guys were struggling to think what they were going to do for that level. And they mentioned this idea of it. I think a bit of a look, and so yeah, as Keith was saying earlier, when it was about, um, they used to scan pictures out of, uh, they scan pictures out of this book of anatomy, and then stuck them all over the um, level. Is there anything to add to that? <laughs> she wants to say something, you can tell. No, 
I don't, honestly. The gap's just steady enough there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we've, we've come to just the end of our, our screening today, so uh, thank you very much again for coming on. I, I do have one final question. This again goes from kind of being around you guys earlier today uh, and actually being around Luke's, Luke's awesome collection that he's put together. Is obviously when Core was closing down and you guys were kind of leaving, you were grabbing hold of memories, I think. What's the, what was the best kind of memory you grabbed hold of and took with you? Um, whether it was in the boot of your car or just in, in, in your head? I think for me, um, despite my slightly jaded outlook on the games industry, I really enjoyed working at Core. I worked with some really, really good guys and women. Yeah, um, really creative people and had a lot of fun working together. Um, I think that's what I'll take away from it. We worked on some really good games, some games that were less good as well. But it was really enjoyable, really enjoyable. I learned a lot and that's yeah, that's pretty much what I took away from it. Yeah, so for me it was definitely like the friendships and the you know the working relationships, but yeah, also everything like I was saying, everything that we learned there. Um, for me the company had been sold, it was Rebellion, um, at that time. And you know, there was no nostalgia associated with that. But I did have a pile of drawings from years ago that you know were safely at home and I was thinking, oh, I'm glad you know I kept those sort of things. Um, and yeah, for me, as I said earlier, it was kind of the mundane, it was the everyday life at core it was just like being as other people have said, with your family. Um, but uh, there was a, a moment, it was when we were at the Games Expo that caught me out, because music often triggers memories, and it was a proper sort of hairs on the back of my neck moment when I heard Nathan's, um, played a little bit of Tomb Raider 2, I think it was, wasn't it, the chandelier music? And although it wasn't a memory, it was more of a feeling, and it transported me there in seconds, and I did get quite emotional, because it caught me out. Um, but yes, I think it was just the general atmosphere of the place. I, if I walked, if I, it, it's an odd thing, isn't it? Your sense of smell. I was talking to this to my daughter the other day. So sometimes, if you walk into a room, something will trigger a memory. And I still get those flashes at core, but there's so many of them, I couldn't sort of pinpoint one particular magic moment at all. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. You know, it, even the building, the building itself, there was something about the building yeah, as well. It was more yeah. like a, a house, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, and there was, you know, the, the family and everybody helped each other. And also, I had a family at court, but I also had a family because my brother always he worked with you as well. And Martin, he's come here he today to support us all. So, yeah, if it wasn't him, really, I wouldn't have any memories. So, thanks again, Martin. And thanks for everybody. Thank you. I think I've got to say something as well. Um, yeah, quite what I'm saying is that <laughs> yeah. I think Core was a special place because um, you know that we had a lot of freedom to create, and that was what was great about it. And we, are, you know, we were left to it, and as you move into different companies, I think in some ways that's why Ancient Darkness ran into trouble because it didn't have that kind of carefully managed thing. But up until that point, we were always just left to our devices to make things and we enjoyed doing it so every day was coming make stuff and stuff was get, going out there and being successful it felt great well thank you once again for coming and joining us this evening and thank you everyone in the audience for coming and being part of this event we hope you've had a fantastic day uh, if you did come to the event and then also a fantastic evening for, for this evening so just i'd just like a round of applause to everyone that's taking part the floor designers and the team that's made, 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 made.